You're listening to Word Crimes. This is Title 18 Word Crimes. I'm Eric Arneson. We're now well into the all Eric all the time season of Word Crimes, and on this episode, I read Bleeding Out by Eric Beatner. Eric Beatner writes hard boiled crime fiction, a lot of it. He won the 2012 Stalker Award for Most Criminally Underrated Author. His books include Rum Runners and its sequel, Leadfoot, which will be coming out in November. Also, The Devil Doesn't Want Me and When the Devil Comes to Call. Book three in that trilogy, The Devil at Your Door, is due out in 2017. The list doesn't stop there. Dig Two Graves, White Hot Pistol, The Year I Died Seven Times, and the story collection, A Bouquet of Bullets, and many more. Eric Beatner lives in Los Angeles, where he co-hosts the Noir at the Bar reading series. He has toured as a musician, painted, written screenplays, acted in short films, fished in the Mississippi, once met Barry Manilow, and his name has been on television more than 100 times. He also designs book covers. And now, here's me reading Bleeding Out by Eric Beatner. Will knew somewhere back in the 8th grade his science teacher told the class how much blood was in the human body, but he couldn't remember the answer right then. He couldn't recall her name either, just that she had a crazy amount of arm fat that swung violently when she wrote on the chalkboard. Must have been her swinging sack of fat that distracted him from learning how many quarts of blood a body held. He didn't have anything to measure it with anyway. Sure was a lot, though. More every second. Harlan did not look good. Chris weaved the car in and out of traffic with more expertise than he had a right to after only two years of having his license, but necessity is the mother of good driving. Will kept both hands on the wound pumping blood out of Harlan's chest and onto the tan cloth seats in the back of Chris's 92 Escort. Not exactly the car of choice for hardened thieves, but as criminals, these three were about as hard as oatmeal. Here, in high-speed retreat from their first job, Will couldn't believe it could all fall apart so completely, so quickly. It made him rethink his entire position on his Second Amendment rights. That whole argument he used to buy into that guns don't kill people, people kill people, he knew now was bullshit with a capital B. If they hadn't gone into that liquor store with a gun, the guy behind the counter wouldn't have felt as threatened, and he wouldn't have pulled his gun. Chris had insisted the gun would be an effective tool to get anyone to do what they wanted, even though it wasn't loaded. It doesn't really work, though, when the person you're pointing the gun at doesn't know it isn't loaded. And if you tell them, then the effectiveness of the gun is really lost. The logic of it had eluded him while they were planning. That guy behind the counter, the one who shot Harlan, had been scared shitless. Will could see it the second Chris pulled the piece. Skinny, Indian, or Bangladeshi or something... His eyes went wide and watery. He thought for sure he was dead. No way he would have gone that ballistic trying to save 200 bucks in the till. He moved fast and kind of jittery, like watching an old silent movie. Only the blood that erupted from Harlan's chest was in technicolor. He must have popped off 10 shots in about 3 seconds. Will and Chris ducked and dove for cover behind a towering display of bargain tequila. Bottles shattered, glass and liquor showered on them. Harlan was hit twice in the chest. Chris made it through a red light with a nanosecond to spare. Can't afford a traffic stop now. We're going to the hospital, right? Right? It was a continuation of an argument Will started with Chris while they were still in the store. After the clerk emptied his gun, he ducked down behind the counter to wait for his inevitable death. Chris was trying to wipe tequila from his burning eyes when he began shouting like a marine on the beach at Normandy. Go! Go! Move it! Will was already at Harlan's side doing triage, which wasn't easy because Harlan tossed his body across the slick floor like a shark out of water. He kept jumping and leaping as if he could somehow still dodge the bullets now lodged in his chest. When Will first applied pressure to the hole just above Harlan's left nipple, he brought with it the alcohol burn of the tequila and some shards of broken bottle. It made Harlan arch his back and yelp. Chris was already out the door, leaving the two of them behind. Outside, Chris had been able to open his eyes enough to notice he was alone. He crouched and made it back to the doorway, but stayed outside. Come on, leave him. Will was outraged. What? Fuck you, come help me. Chris wiped at his eyes again and changed his mind 16 times in a single second before giving in and going inside to help. The echo of the gunshots had faded, and the only sounds were glass crunching under Chris's feet as he ran to meet them. 
Harlan's moans, which were hollow since he couldn't catch his breath with two bullets in his lungs, and the continued drip of tequila from the busted tower of bottles. From behind the counter came the unmistakable sound of reloading. Will snatched up Harlan's legs, Chris grabbed him under his armpits, and they carried him out, slipping on blood and booze as they went. That was all of ten minutes ago, but never in Will's life had so much been crammed into so little time. The hospital, Chris, come on. We can't. They have to report bullet wounds to the cops. He's dying, man. Let's just think it through. Will gave up on trying to use direct pressure and drilled a finger into each hole in Harlan's chest. His right index finger plugged the hole on Harlan's left, and his left index finger pushed all the way up to the knuckle in the hole on his right side. It seemed to work. It couldn't have been a good sign that Harlan barely even flinched when he did it. It had to hurt like hell. He looked groggy, the way he had so many times, before he passed out drunk in high school. The last time was at the graduation party in Harlan's own basement just three months ago. It was just another excuse to get drunk, not like any of them were going to college. Only a week after they graduated, Harlan had noticed that during high school they wanted nothing more than to hook up with older girls from the community college, and how instantly after graduation, the real thrill was trying to score with high school chicks. Funny how that works. So much damn blood. Will's socks were soggy with it. Chris gnawed on his fingernails as he drove trying to figure out some other alternative to delivering Harlan right to the steps of the authorities. Please, man, he's really dying here. Chris tried to shut out Will's pathetic whining. They had all undertaken this together. The possibility of a clusterfuck had always been present. They hadn't discussed it much, but Chris never felt they had to. They were all grown men. They could handle a little hitch in the plan. Please, Chris, take him to a hospital. Please. Will was crying now. He didn't feel like a grown man. He'd never felt like a criminal. He wanted to be back in science class, paying attention, writing it all down, studying for tests, getting scholarships. He was scared straight. A little too late. The car slowed. They were nowhere near the hospital. Chris had driven them out beyond the town limits onto the road that used to lead to the drive-in before that closed back in 1974. Weeds grew up from either side of the road so high you couldn't even see the lights from the semis on the highway. Will kept his head down, fingers thrust into his best friend's chest, weeping for all the bad choices he'd made. Chris gripped the wheel. He had no idea how he was going to explain the blood on the back seat when he brought the car back home. Fuck it. Run the car off the road. Torch it. That was Chris's way. When they were all twelve, they stole a stack of penthouse magazines from Will's dad and spent the afternoon in the woods marveling at the world of sex that awaited them in adulthood. When they returned, Will's father was in the driveway, and the boys panicked. Burn them, Chris said. Five minutes later, when Will's dad came running into the woods to investigate the plume of smoke coming from the backyard, the boys were in trouble on multiple counts. Six years later, Harlan and Will were still following Chris into some bad ideas. Will was barely aware the car had stopped. When Chris slammed the front door, it jerked Will out of his crying jag. The door behind Will opened, and he nearly tumbled out backwards. Both of his fingers popped out of Harlan's chest, making it sound like a party favor. Blood began to flow unabated. Chris pushed Will to the floor and reached in to grab Harlan by the ankles. He yanked once, and Harlan slid on a wet trail of plasma toward the open door. "'What are you doing?' Will asked." Chris yanked again, and Harlan was out of the car, whacking his head on the doorframe on his way to the ground. Will struggled against his slick hands and feet to get footing before he was able to vault himself out of the car onto the cool pavement. The headlights cast bright beams forward, as if there was still something to see ahead of them. Everything behind them fell into darkness like an erased memory. Chris reset his grip on Harlan's legs and dragged his body across the road, leaving a streak of red that looked black in the night. Harlan groaned, but did not protest. He moved, but barely in a way you could call alive. Will was weak. He didn't rush across the road to stop Chris, didn't scream at him to halt. He let his shoulders sag and resumed his crying. Chris, come on. It's Harlan, man. He's one of us. Chris dragged the body into the high weeds and let him go. He wasn't particularly well hidden. 
Where Chris and the body had broken through the weeds was a huge divot in the line of tall grass, like a missing tooth. For a road no one traveled on, it was good enough. Chris didn't look back as he returned to the car. Will crossed the road and sank into the weeds next to Harlan. The matted grass held his body off the ground. The long stalks under Harlan had started to absorb the last few ounces of blood, turning the stalks from light to dark as if the ground was drinking him from a straw. Will heard the door slam as Chris got back inside. The engine idled. Unseen, the steady stream of 18-wheelers rushed by on the highway like the tide going out. Will heard the muffled sound of Chris letting out his anger and fear in a primal scream. The confines of the car trapped most of the sound, but what escaped cut through Will. The engine revved into the red, but the car did not move. Chris took his foot off the gas, and the car returned to idle. The window rolled down. Let's go, man. I'm staying. The left headlight flickered and died. A single beam cut into the dark and lit the road ahead, showing the curve of the pavement leading to the unknown. Will put his hands on Harlan's chest. Not to stop the bleeding, but just to know when he breathed his last. The escort's engine dropped into gear, and Chris spat up gravel from the shoulder as he drove away. Six quarts, Will remembered. The body holds six quarts. Not enough. That was Bleeding Out by Eric Beatner, read by me. Learn more about Eric Beatner at his website, ericbeatner.com. That's E R I C B E E T N E R.com. You can find links to everything about Eric Beatner, including his books, in the show notes for this episode at our website, wordcrimespodcast.com. You can listen to or download the entire Word Crimes catalog on iTunes or Stitcher or over there at our website, wordcrimespodcast.com. If you enjoy Word Crimes, please take a minute to rate the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. That is a terrific way to help other people learn about this little podcast of ours. You can find me at ericarneson.com. That's E-R-I-K-A-R-N-E-S-O-N.com. You can find information about my first book, a short story collection called The Throes of Crime, at my website. Also, a free comic book, some stories in Spanish, and a whole lot more. I'm also at Eric Arneson on Twitter and easy to find on Facebook. The music on this episode is by The Throws. You can find them at The Throws, T-H-R-O-E-S, thethrows.com. Thanks again for listening to Title 18 Word Crimes. We'll be back soon with Eric's story reading something I wrote, three cases only a desperate, below-average private investigator would take.